Good evening, Sector 001. I'm TJ Esnack, your host for the Jupiter Station podcast. And tonight's guest has been a writer of Star Trek for upwards of the last 30 years. Uh, he's most famous for his TNG writings. Um, he has written quite a few TOS books, some comic books, and I'm told he's done a TV show or two. Uh, join, joining us tonight from his home somewhere here on planet Earth is Michael Jan Friedman. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for uh, for having me. Oh, I appreciate you taking time out and talking to us tonight. Sure, sure. My pleasure. So for some of the newbies that watch my show, could you give us a brief background of who you are, how long you've been around? <laughs> I've, I've been around for a long time. Um, uh, let's see. I I, uh, I started writing in eighty one. I, I my first novel was published in eighty five. Um, it was a swords and sorcery um, uh, novel. Uh, the first uh, as it, as it worked out, the first in a trilogy of um, uh, Norse mythology based based. Um, books. And uh, my first Star Trek book came out, I think it was in 88. Uh, it was called Double Double. And it was based on uh, What a Little Girl's Made Of. It was a sequel to that. And uh, subsequently, I wrote uh, another 30 or 31 uh, Star Trek books. I've written over 80 books altogether. Um, I, uh, I've written audio books, a couple of hundred comic books. Um, uh, an episode of Star Trek Voyager. I, I, I collaborated on that, and uh, and so on. So yeah, I, but you know, if you've been around for a while, that kind of stuff just happens. I can imagine, and I remember reading the comic books too. Those were those were really good. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I had a, a great time with those. The comics comics were a different animal because I had to produce one every month. So I would send in outlines of like six at a time and, you know, uh, they would approve four of them. And then one of them, they would say, no, we can't, you can't do this because we're already doing that on the TV show. And, um, and then this sixth one, you can't do it. And we can't tell you why. So it was, it was, it was interesting trying to hit a moving target. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the comic books were a lot of fun. And I actually had a graphic I did up for the comic books, and I'm trying to figure out how to get back to it, which is funny. This this is television podcasting at its finest, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, but basically, it was the it was a four comic series you had done for the TOS through DC. Mm -hmm. um, name escapes me right now. For uh, TOS, yes, um, four issue set. TOS. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one that was. I, I mean, I did a lot of comics. I um, most of them, I think, were next gen. Um, a four issue set. Oh, the Modala Imperative. Is that what you're that, thinking? That's the one. Yeah, actually, and that was. That was four issues of the original series and four issues of the next generation. It was two quartets that worked together. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. There was one for TOS and they did the same four for TNG. Right, right. With those beautiful Adam Hughes covers. And um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, we started a a plot in in the time frame of the original series and it was mostly a checkoff story and um we uh, we continued with that for four issues and then we had a, a, a next generation quartet uh that was um that was written by peter david my friend peter uh at the time he was writing the original series i was writing the next generation and we decided to flip that around for the purposes of, uh, of this project. But it was well, a lot of fun. 
it, it was definitely a project I enjoyed. And granted, I'm about to date myself here. I was probably in my early teens when I read that. So okay, <laughs> and, and like 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 every teenager, you know, eventually your mom throws the comics away, and then you come back from college saying, "Where are my comics?" Oh well, you weren't using them anymore, so I threw them away. Oh. We, we we had some we had some episodes when I was very young where my parents in in order to punish me pretended to throw my comics away when they saw when they saw how despondent I was they they never actually contemplated actually throwing out the comics so I still have them oh that that's probably one of the best things then um, yeah. have you been a Star Trek fan for long forever. As long as Star Trek's been around, I was uh, I was uh, a little kid when um, ne when uh, the original series debuted um, on NBC, and um, I saw that first episode on a unfortunately on a black and white television. They wanted you to be watching in color, um, and uh, but I saw I saw every episode as it came out, and. Uh, you know, it's funny. I mean, uh, by the time I got to college and it was syndicated, um, my friends were watching episode after episode in reruns, and and I wasn't because I'd seen them all. You know, I figured hey, I'm not going to sit there and, and watch it again. I loved it when it when it was happening, and then I, I tend not to not to watch. TV shows, movies, and so on. No matter how much I love them, I tend not to watch them a second time, unless it's for work. It does happen, you know. It does happen for work. Like for instance, that first that first um, uh, book I wrote for uh, for TOS, uh, Double Double. There were a few times I had to go back to the episode and, and watch that to make sure I got everything right. Yeah, even even doing this, I find myself going to like Paramount Plus, and I'll I'll pop up an episode of like whoever I'm whoever I'm interviewing that week. I'll find that specific episode and I'll pop it on just to kind of refresh myself. Um, I did a episode review with a gentleman from the UK, and I actually had to go back and watch the episode from Voyager, and I'm like, wow, I don't remember this. Uh -huh. So there, there are some episodes that I remember, some episodes I don't. So I find myself kind of going back piecemeal. But you're you're not really much of a binge watcher, I'm guessing. Uh, I am. I am a, a binge watcher, actually. I but I but I binge watch things that I've already that that I haven't previously seen. Ah. So so I'll I will I will get hooked on a series and just watch everything, but uh, but I don't watch it a second time. So, as far as writing is concerned, uh, last season I had Todd Stashwick on, and he gave lots of props to the writers of Picard because he he said that his entire character was just what they wrote, and he performed what they wanted to perform. Um, even though he told us this weekend, I guess that the actual character of Shaw itself was designed for him. Hmm. Um, what do you think about the new track that's come out? Well, um, what do I think? I, I love Strange New Worlds. Um, that's my favorite. It's, it's uh, you, know, you know, I've written a couple of um, Pike stories, and uh, I just love what they've done with the character. They, they um, you know, the way they depict Pike is a little different from the Pike that we've seen before, but but at, at, at a certain level, he's exactly the same. At a base level, it's the same character, and um, um, I just love what they've done, done with it, even when they're singing and dancing. I like it. Um, that yes, is my four-year-old's favorite episode. <laughs> So, so I think uh, I think that's my favorite of the new tracks. Um, uh, I like Picard, you know. I like Discovery. I would say they were, they were a little uneven in in certain respects, but um, but there was a lot to commend them, and I was grateful to have them. 
Um, the animated shows are terrific. I mean, you know, it's it's Trek, and and if it's Trek, I'm going to really bend over backwards to give it a chance. Oh my, my family knows knows I'm exactly the same way. Like, I can't wait until there's a new episode, and usually. I'm talking about it for the whole week before the episode starts. Mm -hmm. So by the time the episode actually airs, my family's like, <laughs> like you know, please, they, please. they get a break from it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, uh, I, I've, I've watched, I've watched them all. I've watched them all. I mean, there, there. I have a little catching up to do here and there, but for the most part, I've watched every, every in, uh, incarnation of Trek. Uh, of Trek there is. Um, and, and now I, they have, um, what is it, Starfleet Academy coming out. Right. I think they That's said, what, 2026 20, or thereabouts? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure exactly, but yes. Um, you know, uh, I wrote um, uh, a couple of uh, Acad Starfleet Academy books. There was a, yeah. there was a point where Pocket was, um, you know, the publisher. Of, of the Star Trek series, uh, Star Trek uh, um, in print. Um, there was a point where they were putting out Starfleet Academy books. And uh, um, I wrote two of them. Uh, they were data books, data at the Academy. Hmm. And it was, it was a ton of fun. And it was, um, and, and the, you know, the dirty little secret is that these were actually books that an adult could read. You know, we were, we were writing them for kids and restraining ourselves in certain ways, but but really the the concepts and the and the drama was really, you know, appropriate for for an adult as well. So those were those were fun. So I'm 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 kind of uh, curious to see how they handle the academy, um, uh, but I have every confidence that they'll do it well. And the the casting so far, I mean, Holly Hunter and uh, Paul Giamatti are mm -hmm. like two of the biggest ones, and I'm I for one am excited to see how that turns out. Yeah, yeah, that'll be great. Um, um, yeah, but you know, but you know, you know, Star Trek, Star Trek will occasionally, you know, use uh, an established star like. Like Patrick Stewart, like uh, Whoopi Goldberg, but uh, but uh, it, you know it's always it's also good at taking relative nobodies and turning them into stars. You know, so so um, you know I love Paul Paul Giamatti um, and Holly Hunter, so you know I'm I'm sure they'll do a good job with them. And uh, it's funny you mentioned that they they take relative unknowns and make them stars. I was discussing exactly that with Elizabeth Dennehy, uh two episodes ago, and just I, I joked with her. I said, "Yeah, you're you're not anybody unless you've been on Star Trek at least once." That's true. That's true. Um, uh, you know the the episode that that I co-wrote um, for Voyager. Um, we actually. Um, originally thought it, it was a it was an episode uh the pitch was um uh janeway plays dulcinea to a kazon don quixote and it turned out not to be a kazon but that was the premise uh and um the guy that we had in mind for don quixote for that kind of character was uh elizabeth dennehy's dad and we thought this big guy, you know, a big guy and, and you know, disillusioned and bitter. And, uh, and they gave us Joel Gray, who was not a big guy and, and was completely different from what we had in mind. And it turned out to be an inspired choice, an inspired piece of casting. He was exceptional. Um, Joel Gray, was, he's probably best known now as Jennifer Gray's dad. But um, but uh, he was you know when I was growing up he was a, he was a pretty big star he was he was in best known for cabaret hmm. um, but uh, anyway so he he did a wonderful wonderful job 
So would you consider going back into writing for the shows? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't, right? Yeah, no, no, of course I would. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, when I pitch to the shows and I pitch to Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, um, when I pitched to the shows, they were they were accepting pitches from anyone. In fact, I went to a party. You know, my 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 partner and I went to a party because um, we were going to pitch um, Next Generation, and uh, we went to a party uh, held by uh, Judy and Gar Reeves Stevens, who eventually became writers, staff writers on on Enterprise. But um, at the time, we're freelancers, and they had pitched to the show. And uh, at the party, there were other writers there, and it turned out they had pitched to the show. And then the guy delivered the pizzas, you know, and it's California, so, you know, he had some odd things on the pizzas. And, uh, and when he realized he was in a room full of writers, he said he pitched to the show. <laughs> so everybody, they, they accepted pitches from anyone, something like, something like a thousand story ideas a year. Um, and they don't, they don't have that same uh, uh, policy right now for the Star Trek shows. They're, you know, they're pretty much staff written. So um, uh, I don't know if I'll get the opportunity. I'm not moving to California, you know, to be on staff. So, uh, uh, but if it was offered to me, of course I would do that. Yeah, I, I had that exact conversation with Melinda Snodgrass, and she said that it's just they, they want you to have a, a ready-made show versus, hey, I'm going to pitch an episode. Like, they want, like, the whole series. And if you don't have a whole series, then, you know, she, she's not ready to, to deal with that level of of writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I, her, her situation is a little different from mine. They might expect something more from her. And for me, uh, I would just be pitching an episode. So out of all the things you've written, what was your favorite thing to write? Mm, you, are we talking about on, on, oh boy, you mean including comics and including books? Um, but let's, let's break that down. Like what, what's your favorite novel that you wrote? Okay. I think, well, Double Double was certainly up there. That was my first, and I think I did. I had all this pent up, you know, all these pent up ideas and 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 inspirations. So I think Double Double came out really well. Um, I was very happy with something uh, called Starfleet Year One, um, which which started out as a bonus uh, serial in the backs of all the. Um, uh, Star Trek novels that came out in a given year. I remember and, those. Right. Okay. And then we, what we did is, um, we collected them and we added some ancillary material, and uh, and that was great. And the uh, the idea was we were going to take that and um, turn it into the first of seven books. So Starfleet Year Two, Year Three, etc. Um, and then I was at a bat mitzvah and I was sitting next to Rick Berman's sister and who I'd met before because her, her husband employed my, my friend and, uh, and I'm sitting there and I said, Judy, you know, this fifth series they're coming out with, give me, give me an idea. Give me, throw me a bone here. What is this going to be like? And, uh, and she said, she looked around and she think 200 years before Kirk. And I went, oh, wait a second. Wait a <laughs> second. I'm doing that. I'm writing this thing called, you can't know. They can't do this. She goes, well, that's what they're doing, Mike. And, uh, and so there was a conflict with, between Enterprise and Starfleet Year One, and you can imagine what won. Uh, so we came out with that one issue, that one uh, 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 um, book, Starfleet Year One, and there was a disclaimer in it that it that it uh, it doesn't uh, jibe with the um, events in the series Enterprise, and they and we never came up with Starfleet Year Two. So 
this is this is one of the reasons I'm not a big enterprise fan. Uh, but uh, yeah. so, but Starfleet Year One. Your writing was killed by Jonathan Archer. Yeah. So so I think uh, so that's certainly one of my favorites. Not not the least because because it was it came close to being banned, you know. Um, um, so what else? I really I, I liked Reunion. Reunion was um, the first Next Generation hardcover, and it reunited Picard with his old crew from the Stargazer, and that was that was a lot of fun. Not just because I got to do a murder mystery on the Enterprise, but um, it was fun because I got to invent an entire crew. This is this is the one thing that Star Trek writers, Star Trek writers in general, and certainly print writers love to do the most is invent crews right who's going to be who's going to be the security officer who's going to be the doctor um and uh, and so i got to invent uh, picard's original stargazer crew the only the only um we didn't have a whole lot of information on the stargazer just that it existed and that there was somebody named vigo on it uh, this is this was revealed in um the first season episode called the battle um, that's right i remember that it was a good episode right with the ferengi which also i think uh may have introduced the ferengi or I maybe so, second yeah. ferengi. not sure but anyway um yeah so so we had that's all we knew about the stargazer so i had lots and lots of room to play and uh, reunion was uh, it, you know it was a popular book and uh and uh, it spawned a six book uh, series of stargazer books and um uh, other hardcovers and even comics and other writers decided you know they wanted to borrow those characters on occasion so so um it was it was a great great experience but it also gave rise to other great experiences that I had down the road. So Reunion, definitely one of my favorites. And I, I have to say, as far as, you know, pioneering canon, I'm right there with you. I managed to talk with Dave Blass, who's the production designer for Picard. And just off the cuff, I asked him one day, it's like, hey, so do you think you guys could maybe include, say, a USS Nathan Hale? as like a like a, a backdrop because i know there's like two more seasons coming up dave mm -hmm. and i got the typical hollywood response uh you know what keep watching we'll let you know <laughs> yeah. and i'm like okay thank you for your time and i just moved along and my fan club chapter president texts me one night with just one line what the hell did you do and I, I texted him back. I said, I don't know. I give up. What did I do? He took a picture of his television and sent me a uh, picture of season two, episode one of Picard with a little red circle around it. And sure enough, there's our fan club chapter in actual Starship form. That was great. And That's great. I, I blinked and it's on like the, the wiki page as canon and, you know, everybody's talking about it. I'm like, the hell did I just do? <laughs> well, it's great. As, it's great. You're part as of a card carrying member of the Geek Club. That yeah. was definitely pretty cool. You're part of Trek history. But I can totally appreciate reunion. I loved reading that when it came out. Um, Thank you. I I don't think that they have enough of those novels in in the Trek novels, like. You know, I'm I'm into the Picard novels right now, so it kind of gives you like the backstory of what you didn't see during the episodes. Right. So I like reading books like that because it get, it kind of fills in the blanks, or like the the Lost Years when J.M. Mm -hmm. Dillard wrote those. You know, it kind of like fills in the blanks of what happened between the last mission of the five year mission and Star Trek: The Motion Picture. So people like you keep that stuff going. And I, for one, appreciate it. Thank you. you. You know, that was that was the most, that was the thing I did most often was 
shine a light in some dark corner of the Star Trek universe to show you how something happened, um, what, ha what, what unforeseen consequence there was, um, you know, filling in the blanks and, um, and, and illuminating the things that may have happened off stage. Um, and that was fun. That was, that was the most fun. Um, you know, uh, uh, when I did the adaptation of the Scotty episode, Relics, for in Next Generation. And um, the first thing I did is I called Ron Moore, who had written the episode. And I said, you know, the problem is normally when you do an adaptation, let's say a movie adaptation, um, you get a 120 page script to help you, you know, to give you the bare bones of, of your book. Uh, the Scotty episode was 60 pages. I had, instead of half a book to invent, I had three quarters of a book. So I said, I need some help here. I called Ron Moore, and uh, he was kind enough to tell me, A, yeah, we have a whole script, we have a whole scene written that we couldn't put in the episode. And I, and I said, so what else would you have done if the budget had allowed you? Oh, well, if the budget had allowed, we would have been here and there. And we might even have been on the Dyson in the Dyson sphere. I was like, oh, the Dyson sphere, okay. So he gave me all kinds of ideas that I was then able to incorporate into the book. Um, uh, so you know, filling in those blanks, shining light on dark spaces—that's that's my favorite thing. And and like I said, I am probably one of many who truly appreciate that because it. It gives us that extended track to kind of keep us going till, you know, Strange New World season four happens or something right. like that. Right, right, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I tried. I always tried to, you know, even if it was a, a hardcover novel, I, I, which is longer, of course, I always tried to write it as if it were an episode. You know, I wanted people to be able to see what was going on. Um, I wanted the dialogue to sound exactly like the character sounded in the, in the book. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, and, and I think that came across people, people seem to, to get that, um, and, and to appreciate it. And I'm, I'm sure because it's print, you know, a lot of the reader's imaginations kind of very much help with that and kind of pulled it together and, you know, you write it and you write it like an episode, but then we as readers know what the character's like and we kind of like put that spin on it too. It's interesting you say that because I have a, a theory that people who read science fiction and Star Trek in particular have a talent for constructing, uh, uh, constructing uh, scenes through their imagination. Right. So what I'm doing as a writer is I'm feeding you the cues. Right. And hoping that you can pick up on them because I can't I you know, I could write 50 novels and still not describe everything about a particular episode. So so you have to fill in the blanks. And I really feel like that's a talent and probably, in, you know, uh, a, a talent that doesn't get enough enough um, admiration that you know readers of these things they, they they like to read them because they're getting what they need to construct those scenes in their heads um so it's really i think you know writing is really a collaboration between the the reader and the writer oh most definitely in fact like, like i mentioned before todd stashwick said almost that exact thing like it's it's very much a team effort so and I don't, I don't think a lot of readers really realize that they are actually part of the team when they read the work that you put out for us. Yeah, yeah, that's. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. But, but they, you know, they definitely have a talent that's that's uh, invaluable. Um, and you know, I, I feel like I had that as a reader. You know, like I could use my imagination to take what the the author was giving me and construct these these scenes in my head. Um, so I know how that how that works. 
um, and and as a writer, you kind of you you want to give just the right cues, you know, no more, no less, and just the right ones that uh, that the reader needs to to um, bring their imagination to bear. And and definitely with with Trek fans, there's definitely no shortage of imagination. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, you could see that at any at any Trek uh, convention masquerade. There is oh, I will, no, no I will be seeing that in person in Rhode Island on November second. So oh, good, good, cool, cool. That's great. I, I may end up squishing into my uniform. Just happen to pick up a a red shirt and it's size three X, but it's Chinese okay. size three X, so it's like a one X. <laughs> And it's a red shirt. Well, it's it's like a it's the season three Picard red shirt. So it's like uh -huh. uh, like what Captain Shaw wore. It's like basically that, but still, it's like TNG. So it's not the same red shirt. So so you're not in any jeopardy. No. Okay. Good. good. No, and I, I I usually have at least you know three or four gold shirts I can throw in front of me anyway. So. Okay. Good. 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 I, um, I like. I actually like wearing red shirts to Star Trek conventions because you get, <laughs> you get these gasps like, oh my God, you're tempting fate. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a, a volunteer firefighter, and at one point my fire chief's paid job had him wearing a red shirt. And he walks into the firehouse one night, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> and he's like, what? I said, hold on. And I'm sitting there and flip through my phone and I find like all the red shirt memes that I'm sending to him. Like, okay, read your phone. Right. What? Right. What does this mean? Like, <laughs> we can't talk to each other anymore. Like, you need to do some homework. Mm. And he, I, I think I got him to watch like one episode and he figured it out. It's like, I'm not that kind of red shirt, dude. I'm like, I know. Like, we're going to start calling you Scotty. <laughs> so, Mike, it was really great having you on. Um, cool. I hate to cut it short, but um, I just got home from work, so dinner is upon us. Oh, oh, listen, you got to have your priorities. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking time out and talking with us. Um, sure. And sure. I will send can you the I link plug, to this when I have it put together. Can I plug uh, my, my publishing group? You uh, can plug anything you want. It's a Crazy Eight Press, um, and uh, you can reach it at crazy8press.com. It's uh, all the work that I've been doing in the last few years, as well as the work that uh, um, you'll see from other other writers whose names Trek uh, fans will be familiar with. Um, you'll see what we're doing these days, and it's um, there you go. And it's um, uh, we've got like eighty books in inventory from our various writers, and and it's these are the the most authentic and heartfelt visions that we have. And because uh, we've banded together at Crazy Eight Press, we have the opportunity to to pass them on to readers. So thanks for well, is... thanks for giving me that that platform. Oh, not at all. In fact, I just got a copy of Lawrence Luckinbill's. Um memoirs and i actually ended up interviewing him for my last episode no oh, okay um, so far it is it is an amazing book and i'm going to be doing a book review on the podcast at some point but cool. i definitely recommend you you pick it up it is definitely not cyborg i mean it includes no. that but it it definitely is a, a really good read cool all right good thanks for thanks for letting me know well, Mike, I will let you know when this uh, when this hits YouTube. I'll send you the link. Um, but thanks for taking time to speak with us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome, and we'll talk to you later. Okay.
And now for more news and information. This weekend, rather this past weekend, uh, visitors to New York's New York Comic Con were greeted by Robert Picardo and a live stream from the set of Starfleet Academy, which, according to reports, has been granted not only a new second season, but also a new guest star. Uh, this week, it was announced at New York Comic Con that Tatiana Maslany from She-Hulk will appear in season one as a guest star. Though it's unclear what her role is, um, Ms. Maslany is uh, an alumni of Orphan Black and She-Hulk. Um, Robert Picardo and co-showrunner Alex Kurtzman had announced that the show had been renewed. Uh, we're following this story as it's developing. Uh, but from what we can tell you, uh, the official logline for Starfleet Academy states that it will follow the adventures of a new class of Starfleet cadets as they come of age in one of the most legendary places in the galaxy. The series will introduce viewers to this young group of cadets as they come together to pursue a common dream of hope and optimism. Uh, and as I said, we're going to be following the story as it develops. Uh, also, Strange New Worlds, uh, I believe, has finished filming their third season and currently working on their fourth. Um, and an exclusive clip was released to New York Comic Con on the season opener of season three. Um, and we may actually have that for you momentarily. Stand by. Orders, Captain. Shields that fifty percent. Captain. Orders, Captain. Ura, repeat Echo's last order. Retreat and rendezvous. Retreat and rendezvous with the fleet, sir. He gave coordinates. But he didn't say immediately. All right, who's got ideas? Vibrationary tactics. We're we'll too boxed in. Vent the nacelles, create a cloud? We need to be able to see. Jam their comms so they can't coordinate attacks. That's it. That's the one. You go and use light for ship to ship messaging. I'm modulating the deflector rate to emit a spectrum. Use them for a bit. All right, now how do we beam our people back to Enterprise? The scans indicate the board ships are transport resistant. Even if we get past the shields, we need authorization codes. No time to hack codes. Retreat and rescue. It's the best of a bunch of bad options. So how do we track this specific ship across light years of space? Wolkite, a rare element that contains subspace gauge bosons. If we modified a homing beacon... Gorn would see a beacon coming from a mile away. Not if it's a torpedo. We tag him with a dud. The Gorn won't know what we're up to. <laughs> Shields at 30 percent. For this to succeed, we still need to penetrate the Gorn's defensive systems. We've been hitting them with everything we've got. It doesn't do much. Uh, energy shields work on harmonics. If we find the right frequency, we can ram the ship. Indeed. When our shields make contact with theirs, they will create a destructive interference pattern and momentarily interrupt both frequencies. With our shields down, we'd be sitting ducks. We'd only have one shot. That's all we need. Mitchell, bring us around head to head with the destroyer. Time to play a game of chicken. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
All decks prepare for impact. Full impulse on your orders, Captain. Inertial dampeners to maximum. Everybody hold on to something. Muna. Let's hit it. Fire torpedoes. Help move us out of here. On it. Hang in there, guys. Whoa. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, and in other news, we have uh, climate conventions that are coming up. Um, this weekend, I'm sorry, my apologies. November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd is the Rhode Island Comic Con. Uh, held at the Providence Civic Center. It's going to feature comic artists, comic writers, uh, and actors from every genre, more specifically uh, Star Trek for you and I. Uh, Michael Dorn, William Shatner, and a few others will be appearing. Um, I myself will be at Rhode Island Comic Con if any of you want to stop by and see me. I'll be working with the Starfleet booth. Um, we'd love to see you. Come on out, visit us. I would be more than happy to discuss Starfleet, Star Trek, uh, the podcast. Um, I will actually be doing recruiting for Starfleet, the international Star Trek fan club. So stop by our booth and see us. Um, I will probably let you guys know more the day of. Uh, in addition to that, we also have, um, I believe it is the Motor City Comic Convention. Stand by. The Motor City Convention, uh, Motor City Comic Con in Novi, Michigan, in November 8th through 10th. Um, and additional to that, which is November 8th to 10th, Winnie in Lombard, Illinois, also November 8th and 10th, Grit City Comic Show in Tacoma, Washington, November 9th, Jersey Shore Comic Book Show, November 10th, uh, Conjuration uh, Con, November 15th to the 17th. And the Walker County Comic Con in Huntsville, Texas, November 15th to the 17th. Um, we'll be trying to follow all these cons and we'll try to keep you as best posted as we can to events that will be in your area. Um, I'm TJ Esnack, and this has been News and Information.